Hello there, and welcome to this first video on phylogeny. So we're going to be looking at, over the course of the coming videos, uh, the tree of life and how we can build pictures of evolutionary relationships. And we're going to start off by talking about some broad context that we need to know when it comes to looking at phylogenetics. That's the field in which we derive phylogenies, a term I will define for you in a minute. But the first thing we need to consider when we're thinking about um, phylogenetics is how we can classify life. And no doubt you will have learned elsewhere that one of the ways we do so is through Linnaean taxonomy. So taxonomy itself is the scientific classification of organisms. Um, by extension, sometimes we call um, kind of uh, understanding any categorization of anything such as soils uh, taxonomy as well. Most scientists use the Linnaean hierarchical classification system. So you can see an example of this on this slide. You see this lovely jumping spider here on the right. This is a member of a group called the eukaryotes, creatures with nuclear creatures, cells with nuclei in their cells. It's an animal. Um, it's a member of a grouping called the arthropods, limbs with jointed, sorry, limbs animals with jointed limbs and a whole suite of other features that defines this group. And it's an arachnid. That's the, um, the class of arthropods that includes spiders, but also scorpions, harvestmen, and a, a host of other creatures. This itself, this beautiful creature here, is a member of the order Araniae, that's the spiders. And indeed, if we were looking to, to look into it in a bit more detail, this is actually a jumping spider. Jumping spiders are members of the family Salticidae. And this is the, the genus Philippus and the species Regius. So this Linnaean taxonomic system is very good for arranging organisms and it is used in some elements of research. If you want to understand, for example, the biodiversity of the world outside, we don't generally do so by counting species as a useful unit of biodiversity, as we've learned in other uh, lectures on this course. The Linnaean taxonomy, however, does not necessarily reflect evolutionary relationships. So this form of taxonomy does not always map to how we think organisms are related, as I'll give you a series of examples demonstrating in just a bit. As we learned in Evolution 201 in this course, evolution is the root cause of species. So speciation is the, uh, the process by which species evolve. And as such, there has been a move towards um, using evolutionary relationships to classify groups. This actually has a relatively recent um, history, so it's a recent advent, but it has become the standard approach to think about organisms in terms of their evolutionary relationships since the 1970s, where computers became powerful enough to allow us to take other non-Linnaean approaches towards taxonomy. So let's learn more about that. When we are studying the patterns of evolutionary relationships, we can call this systematics. So systematics is the study of the diversity of organisms and their natural relationships. Sometimes this word is used as a synonym of taxonomy, as per the definition on that slide. But that's not really correct because systematics is, is kind of like a subset of how we do that. We're, we're looking at the evolutionary relationships and ignoring, I guess, a number of other ways that we could choose to do this. The chief way nowadays by which systematics is driven forward is using cladistics. There's a definition of this on the slide. So cladistics is a special taxonomic system applied to the study of evolutionary relationships. It proposes that common origin can be demonstrated by the shared possession of derived characters. Characters in any group can be either primitive, not a word we tend to use anymore, we'll learn the proper word for that later on in this series of videos, or derived. So much of what we're going to be covering today is actually covering this idea of cladistics, this special form of taxonomy by which we categorize animals by their evolutionary relationships. The, um, this definition mentions characters, which are really quite important towards this um, kind of way of understanding life. And those characters can be molecular. They can use DNA. DNA comprises nuclear bases that we can read. And if we, are, for example, align those between taxa, we can start to think of these in a systematic framework. Uh, or we can use the amino acids these nuclear bases code for. But either way, we can look at how similar or different organisms are 
based on the string of nuclear bases that basically define them. But we're not just limited to using DNA, we can use morphological characters as well. Morphological characters are, are things that can be quite a, a loose concept at times, where we can codify the anatomy of an organism into characters showing different states. So these could, for example, be the presence of a tail. So if we were to create a morphological character that says tail, present or absent, this handsome lizard on the top right hand corner would have a tail, whereas all of the rest of these organisms would not. They just have a, a body with no a kind of post-anal structure that we would um, define a tail as. We could, for example, look at the number of legs of these creatures, three leg pairs, two leg pairs, four leg pairs, say. So if we're doing this, if we're using morphological characters to define groups, there are some core assumptions by which we um, build up relationships. And one of those is that characters change or are acquired over time. We also know, and uh, a fundamental assumption of most life sciences, is that any group of organisms uh, is related, either you know, quite recently or a very long time ago, by common descent. Any group of organisms that's related by common descent, we will call, and can call, a clade. So a clade is a group of organisms comprising an ancestor and all of its descendant forms. So it's this idea of a clade that gives the, um, gives cladistics its name, because cladistics is dealing with clades, essentially. Clades and cladistics assume character similarities and differences reflect evolutionary history. And that's true, we haven't really found a, um, uh, a kind of a, a completely uh, uh, isolated uh, incident where that isn't actually true. But as we'll learn about in some of the other videos, we have to be careful when we're thinking about um, characters in cladistic terms because of, uh, of a variety of evolutionary processes. So we'll cover that and we'll talk about characters a bit more in one of the subsequent videos. I wanted to spend the rest of this video just quickly looking into phylogenies. So a phylogeny, and you can see two examples on this slide here, is a... Um, is the evolutionary history of an organism or a group of related organisms. That would be a clade. So we can see a phylogeny here of us and our closest relatives. So there's us, chimpanzees and gorillas. Um, sometimes we call, refer to the general area as, uh, as, a, as phylogeny, such as in this lecture, or more correctly, I suppose, phylogenetics. This is the study of phylogenies. Uh, a phylogeny is often used to refer to just one of these diagrams here, but what this really is, this diagram, is it's showing us a hypothesis of evolutionary relationships. So this is a statement, in this case, that says that we, humans, are more closely related to the chimpanzees than we are to the gorillas. This point in the tree here implies that we share a common ancestor to the exclusion of the gorillas. That's what this hypothesis, this statement, this phylogeny is telling us. This implies that uh, the cladogenic event that led to the, um, the, the birth of the, the human lineage and the, the chimpanzee lineage happened more recently in time than that which gave birth to the three lineages, the gorillas, the humans and the chimps. That's what this diagram on the left hand side is showing us. This is sometimes referred to as a cladogram. And this right-hand side is showing us exactly the same set of evolutionary relationships, but it's just showing us that in a slightly different form. No matter how we draw a phylogeny, these two basically mean exactly the same thing. And in both of these, we can assume that time is going from left to right as they are drawn. So that's a fairly simple example. If you want to draw it yourself in R, here's the code that I used to do it. Feel free to give that a shot. Um, but these are simple examples where we have just three species in our tree. But we can have many more than that, such as the um, examples that you can see here. Uh, this is slightly more abstract. Rather than labeling our tips with the names of animals, I just labeled them A, B, C, D, and E. And what 
this is telling us is exactly the same, but we can think about it in a more abstract way. If we look on the left-hand side here, we can see that B and E share a common ancestor to the exclusion of A, but A, B and E share a common ancestor to the exclusion of C. That's what this phylogenetic um, hypothesis uh, that is implied by this phylogeny um, is essentially stating. But we're not just limited to drawing our trees like this, as I've already covered, we can draw them in a number of different ways. And I just wanted to highlight this by showing you three different examples of the same evolutionary relationships that are shown in a circular form and in a couple of other um, forms, which we can call, um, for example, this one's the daylight method of drawing these trees in a package called ggplot2. But all of those mean exactly the same Thing. They're just drawn in different ways. And this is slightly more abstracted than our previous example. If we want to zoom out and kind of think about this even bigger, in an even bigger scale, obviously, ultimately, as we've already covered in um, evolutionary milestones, we can take this to the kind of the biggest um, tree we can possibly have, which is the overall tree of life. We know that if there is one origin of life, there is just one true evolutionary tree for all life on Earth. That's shown in a beautiful diagram by Yi Fan Hu on this slide here. So thinking about phylogenies, essentially often we'll be just thinking about a particular subset of this larger group uh, or this larger tree of life that links everything that is alive today together. So that's some context into which we're now going to like step and we're going to look at phylogenetics in a few more details. Um, so I will see you very shortly in the next video.